right, brethren, Ephesians chapter 1. I want to mainly speak on verses 22 and 23. God has raised Christ far above all power, giving him a name above every name. Verse 22 says, And he hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Christ is the head over all things to the church, and the church is his body. The church is the fullness of him, and Christ is he who filleth all in all. He's the head over the body. Being the head of the church is the glory that belongs to our resurrected, glorified God-man mediator. This glory belongs to him. He's the head. He's the head. Over in Colossians, Christ's glory is declared, and I want you to hear these things that the Lord puts side by side with his glory as our head. Listen to this. In Colossians 1.15, the Son of God is called the image of the invisible God. That's his glory. He is God in human flesh, the image of the invisible God. Then Colossians 1.15 says he's the firstborn of every creature. And here's what that means. He tells us plainly what it means. By him were all things created by Christ, things that are in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He gets all the glory, being the firstborn of every creature, being the creator of all things. All things were created by him and for him. And right alongside that glory, he says in Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And our text tells us it's from his glorious fullness that Christ himself filleth all in all his people. He fills all in all his church. So the glory of being the head of the church, the glory of filling all in all belongs to Christ He's the head of the church. The church is his body. He's the head, and he fills all in all his body. And it's so that he might have the preeminence. This is, this is God's will that all fullness dwell in his son. It pleased the Father, and he, he will have all preeminence. He's the head. He's the head. Now, who's his church? Before we get into my text and, and get into my message, who's the church? Who is Christ's church? The word means assembly. Now some think that the local church is only is the only assembly, that it's just the local church that is Christ's church. Well, indeed, the, the local assembly that Christ has gathered, that Christ has assembled, who he's regenerated, in whom he dwells, who believe in him, that those local members are members of his body. They are his church. That local those local, that local body assembled who are regenerated and believe on Christ, that is his church. But Christ's church is also universal. It's made up of all his saints, of all his saints. Some are in glory with him, some are alive in this earth. This is the universal church spoken of in Scripture. It's made up of all believers, of all generations, called out of all nations and tongues. Some in the earth, some in the heaven. Listen, writing to the saints, writing to the saints. This is what the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 12, 22. Ye are come unto Mount Zion. What's that? You've come to the city of the living God. You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, those that are already with him in glory, 
and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel, see that you refuse not Christ that speaketh. You see, the general assembly here, that word means the assembly of all. It means the whole assembly, all his saints in heaven and in earth. That this is the church of the firstborn, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, his body. It's, it's all his saints in heaven and in earth. This make up his church. And he says, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. It's Christ speaking. He's the head. He's the prophet, priest, and king we just sang. And he's the one ministering through his preachers, through his gospel, into the hearts of his people. And that's why he says, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. Christ is speaking. I like to think about the saints in heaven and the saints in earth. When we are assembled to worship the Lord, I like to picture the whole church of our Lord bowed down at his footstool, giving him all the glory. And that's how it is. That's how it is. One of the brethren texted me back when I had uh, sent out the email and said, let me know he got the message and said, I look forward to meeting you at Christ's footstool. And that's what we're doing. We're meeting all the saints in heaven, all the saints in earth, meeting at Christ's footstool to hear him and give glory to him. If somebody asks you, who are the members of your church? You can say the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle James, John. They're all members of our church. That's right. That's right. So there are some, though, who belong to Christ who he's yet to call. He hasn't called them out yet. They, they haven't heard the gospel by his grace and been regenerated and brought to faith in it. That's why the church is yet in this earth. That's why we're here. It's to sound forth this gospel to call them out. That's right. He raised him from the dead. He set him at his own right hand in heaven far above all. He's given him a name above all. He hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, I want to give you three things that why this is good news to us, why it's good news that Christ is our head. First of all, it's good news because of headship, because of what headship means. Now, with our own body, we get this. The head represents the whole body. You know, if, if somebody says, get a head count, well, when they go around and count the heads, you know what they mean? The whole person. When they count the head, they, they, they mean the whole person is present. We get that, don't we? What the head, the head represents the whole body. Well, so it is in, in God's ordained purpose. God chose a people freely by his grace, gave them to Christ to save, and Christ is our head. He has been from eternity. He's our head. He's the head of his body, the church. Ephesians 5 says, verse 23 says, Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. He's the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. It's his body. It says we're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. We're one with him, been, have been from eternity. This is why God, now God did this. God made the first man, Adam, to be the head of all his body. God did that. And he did it because he had already made Christ the head of all his body. Romans 5 says, Adam is the figure, he's the picture, the type of Christ that's to come in headship, in headship. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 gives us this word. It says, in Adam all die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now with our human body, we get this too. With the, whatever the head does... That's what the body does. The head gives the orders to the body. And what the head does, that's what our body does. Well, so it is with Christ. In Adam, all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. When you read all in connection with Adam and Christ, these are the two heads, Adam and Christ. When you read all in connection with them, it means all whom each head represented. All who each head represented. It means all who shall be born of those 
respective heads. All who each represent it. With Adam, it means all without exception because we're all of Adam. We all were in Adam. We all came from Adam. So it means all without exception. All without exception. But with Christ, it means all who the Father chose by his free unmerited grace and gave to Christ in eternity. All who Christ, that's all who Christ represented. That's what the word all means when it refers to Christ and his laying down his life. All who he represented. Look back up there at verse 3. It's plain that God chose a people. This is what he's saying to those, who, those saints who are called to faith in Christ. Here's how this all began. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So in eternity, God ordained what these two heads did, their body would do. That's God's purpose. That's how God set this whole thing up. What these two heads did, those, those, their body would do. In Adam, all died. Adam sinned, and in Adam all died. He was our head. All became guilty. All are born with Adam's corrupt nature because Adam's the head of all men. What Adam did, his whole body did. In Adam all died. That's true of everybody in this earth. Everybody born into this world all died in Adam. But in Christ, all his elect shall be made alive. In Christ, all his people fulfilled all righteousness. When he fulfilled all righteousness, that's why he came. When he fulfilled all righteousness, under the law, he did it for God, to glorify God. He did it for his people, to save his people. And all who he represented were made righteous by Christ. All. In Christ, we died under the justice of the law. The soul that sins has to die. God's holy. And that's why Christ died on the cross. No other reason. He laid down his life for his people. He bore our sin and bore the wrath of God, the justice of God due to his people. He died for a particular people. He knew who he was dying for. All his body, his, the members of his body. And when he died, all his members died under the justice of God. His whole body did. But when he came out of the grave and arose and sat down at God's right hand, all his body came out and sat down with him. All are alive in Christ at the right hand of God, seated with him in glory. What Christ did, his people did. Christ being the head means Christ is our redemption. It means Christ is our salvation. He's our life. He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. In whom, verse 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That's what he accomplished. Now, sinner, if you've never believed on Christ, believe on Christ. If you've never cast your care on Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the scripture. Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Crimson is mighty red. And that snow out there is mighty white. And we just read, though our sin be red like crimson, in Christ, by Christ, through faith in Christ, is whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. Believe on him. Now, secondly, the good news of Christ being our head means Christ is our life. He's our life. Verse 23 says the church is his body, the fullness of him. Now, again, looking at our human body, a man can't live without his head. And the head can't, is not alive without the body. We can live without a finger. We can live without an arm. My dad just had a toe amputated. We can live without a toe, but we can't live without a head. And here's the good news. Because his body is the fullness of him, Christ won't be complete until he has every member of his body called into oneness in his body. 
and he shall do this because Christ is our life. Christ is the head of the body and every chosen child is a member of Christ's body and he's our life. He said, because I live, you shall live also. That's good news. That's good news. All Christ's church is risen in glory with him right now, seated with him in glory at God's right hand. The life of every member of Christ's body is Christ. He's our life. We were dead in sins just like every other sinner. We come into this world dead in sins, hating God, unable to believe him, not wanting to believe, not willing to believe him making all our excuses and all our reasons for not believing on him. And we couldn't. We just couldn't. But here's the good news. Before we knew him, Christ was our life. Before we knew him, Christ had redeemed his people. And he's going to bring you to know him and make you to know he's your life and give you faith and life to believe him because this is the point of the whole passage. He's telling us here that the same exceeding greatness of power that it took to raise Christ from the dead is the same greatness of power it takes to raise a dead sinner to life to believe on Christ. That's what he's declaring. And our risen head, he's declaring here, gets all the glory for quickening his people, sending the Spirit, giving us life, and bringing us to faith in him. After he declares this, the very next verse, Brother Greg read, says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespassing and sin. That's what our Lord does. We're spiritually dead sinners as we come into the world, but it's by the power of Christ our life that we're given life to believe that it might be all of his grace. And that's how you know when somebody's been given life, they're going to give him all the grace for doing it, all the glory for doing it by his grace. Brother Greg just read it. I won't labor it, but God, verse 4, who's rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins. That means we didn't love him first. He loved us first. We were dead in sin. And yet he quickened us together with Christ. And he's telling us there, by grace are you saved. You know what grace is? Grace is undeserved, unmerited, even demerited favor. We did everything we could that if it wasn't for grace, it would have destroyed any hope. But he, by grace, grace means it's all of God. Grace means it's freely given by God. We're saved by grace. He says on down there in verse 8, by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we're his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we shall walk in them. That's what it means. We shall. Why? Because Christ is the head of his church. And he's the, he's the fullness. He fills all in all. Not one member of the church, not one member of Christ's body lives by his own life. We live by Christ our head who is our life. Here's the good news. Christ shall regenerate each member of his body. He shall give us life. He shall bring us into union with him and make us know this because our head is our life. And here's the good news for you who believe him, for you who he has quickened and regenerated. Paul said in Colossians 3, you're dead. Oh, that means so much. You're dead under the law. You died at Calvary. Your body's dead right now. But your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. He is the hope of glory. He is the life in you who believe. And right now, your life is at God's right hand. And when our life appear, you shall appear with him in glory. This, you know, don't you love how the scripture doesn't speak in maybes? It doesn't speak in this might happen. <laughs> Why? He has all power. He is the power. He created this whole thing. He upholds it by the word of his power. It's by his power we believe. It's by his power we kept. It's by his power he's going to bring us to glory. It's not maybe. It's yes and amen. It's yes and amen. It's sure. It's ordered and sure in all things. Now lastly, it's good news because of headship. What Christ did, we did. This is good news because Christ our head is our life. 
He's our light. Now here's good news right here too. Christ being our head means Christ gets the glory for filling all in all. Christ our head has the rule over all. He's controlling everything. The God man. We're talking about, we're talking about a man in our nature glorified who is God and he's ruling everything. Everything. And so Christ our head shall fill all in all. You know on the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, whenever the, uh, the men, the, the spirit was poured out and there was all different Galileans were there and all these different nations and those men began to preach in languages they had never learned. And the people that were sitting there with all those different languages, they began to hear them in their own language and they began to hear the mighty works of God. That's what they were preaching. And some believed on him. Some began to cry out and believed on him. And you remember what Peter said? Peter said, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we're all witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. Christ did every bit of that. Christ did every bit of that. They wanted to leave. They wanted to leave Jerusalem. They didn't want to go back there. Christ met them. And what did he do? He said, go back and wait. Wait. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom? It's not for you to know what I'm going to do. You go back and you wait. <laughs> to the Spirit's poured out. And he poured out the Spirit. He gave them that ability to speak the gospel in languages they'd never learned and he blessed it to the hearts of those they preached to and brought them to believe and that's where he united all those saints together and we see that early church start out from there all by Christ he worked all that and he's doing it now he's doing it right now Christ our head gets the glory for filling all filling all it, it, he's fulfilling the scriptures he gets the glory for fulfilling the scriptures. And this is what the scriptures are all declaring. All these various things Christ shall do. And, that, and he gets the glory. He's fulfilling all. He said, I must fulfill the law and the prophets. And he's fulfilling all. So what all does he feel? Well, Christ our head gets the glory of filling his pulpit in his local assembly. He promised, he, he pleased God to save by the foolishness of preaching. Well, who's going to get the glory for the preacher? Christ did. Christ gets the glory for giving his preacher, fulfilling the pulpit with his preacher. He said in Jeremiah 3.15, I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. The church at Danville right now is in need of a pastor. They're waiting on a pastor. There's more churches that are going to be needing pastors soon. But men do not fill a pulpit. Men do not make a pastor. Men do not make themselves a pastor. Christ makes his pastor. Christ gives his preacher. He fills the pulpit. That's the glory that belongs to him to fill all in all. Look at Ephesians 4 and look at verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity and gave gifts unto men. Look at verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. I put an article in the bulletin uh, about Moses. Moses was called, he was a pastor, uh, one of God's preachers. And um, there's a big difference in, in Moses' spirit from when he began to see that God was going to use him he made some very bad mistakes in the beginning because he supposed his brethren would understand, but they didn't. But 40 years later, when the Lord had prepared him and humbled him and on the backside of the desert made him a nobody, he had a whole different spirit. He said, Lord, who am I <laughs> that you should use me to preach this gospel? That's Christ's doing. That's his doing. And then Christ our head gets the glory for filling the pews. He gets the glory for filling the pews and fulfilling the hearts of his people. Christ said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. It's not just people coming in and sitting down on, on their own. 
when it's when it's truly done, it's Christ Himself gathering His people together by His power and His Spirit, His sovereign hand gathering His people together. That's where He's in the midst. Men don't create the church. Men don't make pastors. Men don't make a church either. Christ does it. Christ gathers His people together, and He makes. His people's church. Not everybody that gathers together is his church. But he's the one that gathers his people together and keeps them together. Listen to this. It's Christ the head. Ephesians 4.15 says, It's Christ the head from whom the whole body is fitly joined together and compacted. He's the one that does it. You know, somebody out of the blue will walk in, sit down, and they start hearing. Start hearing. Next thing you know, they say they believe on Christ. They believe he's their only hope, and they want to confess him in believer's baptism and identify with his people and unite with his church. How does that happen? Christ does it. He's far above all power, all principality, all dominion, ruling everything in this world, and he brings his people together. He gathers them together. Colossians 2.19 speaks of Christ the head from which all the body are knit together. Knit together. And not only does he assemble his body, he knits us together in heart, in him. By one spirit. He takes sinners from every tribe and kindred and nation, from all different backgrounds that would have nothing in common otherwise. And he gathers us together under the preaching he's provided, and he speaks into the heart, and he makes us one. He makes us one by what he does in his body. Ephesians 4 4. When he's done this work, there's one body, one spirit. Even as you called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. That's Christ's glory. That's what Christ works. He filleth all in all. And then Christ our head gets the glory for growing each member of his body, for growing us by his spirit through his gospel, by his sovereign hand in providence, and he gives you and me the privilege of being used by him to speak the gospel, the truth of the gospel of Christ through which he works in the hearts of his people. That's a great privilege, great privilege. But it's Christ our head's glory to minister gifts of grace which Christ has procured for us by his death on the cross by his burial and his resurrection. This is not at the exclusion of God the Father and God the Son. God the Father, I mean, uh, God the Son, Father and the Holy Spirit. The three, the three persons of Godhead are working in the Son of God, Christ our Redeemer, and he gets the glory. He's the head of the church who filleth all in all. Ephesians 4, 7 says, Unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of of Christ. Christ is the one giving in measure as he will. Through the preaching of the gospel, Ephesians 4.15, we preach the truth in love and he says we grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. It's his working in every part by that measure of the gift of his grace that he gives to each member. He's working. He's using each member. He's working in each of us and making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Christ speaks, or Paul speaks in Colossians 2 about men who don't know anything about this. So they're talking about other things. They're talking about things that Vang jangling. But he says it's Christ, the head from which all the body by joints and bands have nourishment ministered and are knit together and increase with the increase of God. Now, one member of the body might begin to say, well, but I don't have gifts that another has. I'm weak. I, I, I'm, I'm a sinner and I'm weak and I don't have near the gifts another has. I'm not needed in the body. And sadly, 
Maybe another member in the body will start thinking that same thing about that weak member. But that's not so. That's on purpose. That's Christ working on purpose. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. Go back to your left there. 1 Corinthians 12. Christ has provided each member of his body, put us in the body together, framed us together, knit us together in the body together, and, and it's through these members Christ provides for every other member of his body. For every member of his body. Just like in our human body. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one, He's talking about the human body right there. As the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. It's just like he made your human body to illustrate this. That's why he made all things are made by him and for him. It's to illustrate. You know, our human body is amazing. It is amazing. Christ made it that way. But it pales in comparison to the glory of Christ's body. Because Christ is the head, and he's working in his body, and he gets the preeminence. That this is certain. <laughs> what he's saying here, he works in his people. Watch this, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body's not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where would be the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Ooh, that's a good word right there. Because Christ is the head. <laughs> we're the feet. And we need the head, don't we? Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. They're necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. The, the beautiful parts don't have a need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. You get what he's saying. You take one of the members of your body, your human body, when 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 it's when it's maimed in some way, say a finger broken, you give more care to it. All the other members of your body are caring for that broken member. Every member. That's the uncomely part. The, the, the parts that aren't broken, that are, un, that are comely, they don't need more abundant honor. That broken part does. And so we bestow more on it. And then when there's, and when there's rejoicing, we rejoice. When we suffer, we suffer. This is how he's put the body together so that Christ successfully works this in those that are members of his body to make us care for one another so that there's no schism in his body. There is no schism in his body because Christ is working. He filleth all in all his people. This is the glory we have, the good news we have. Christ shall work this. What does that mean? Well, one, it means 
we should not live like the heathens live in, in sin and rebellion anymore. And it means we should put on the new man and walk according to, to Christ our Lord, Christ our head. It means we should walk as dear children, as children of light. But it also means that he's going to give us ample opportunity to have to bear one another's burdens, that is, bear one another's sins and falls. He's going to give us ample opportunity to have to, to go and, and do what we can as he opens the door to minister to one another. That means even when somebody's haughty and acts like they don't, they don't need you and they don't need your grace, that's hard to do. But they need they they are uncomely and they need more abundant honor. That means one that has fallen in sin, they're uncomely, they need more abundant honor. Both of them need to be ministered to and pointed to Christ and reminded. Christ is our head. He's our head. He's our head. He's filling all in all his people. And it's this word of grace, this word of the gospel, he's given us to speak in every occasion. The same word by which he quickened you in the first hour and called you to faith in him and made you see his glory. This is what we sing in every song we sing. This is what we preach in everything we preach. Christ, our life, our head, our resurrection, our redemption, our all, him. And it's this word of speak when we're bestowing that more abundant honor on an uncomely part because this is the word he's going to bless the word that gives him the glory the word that reminds us what he's done for us and what he's doing for us and what he shall do for us the word that reminds us Christ is ruling all effectually and shall not lose one member that's the word we're to speak that's what breaks your heart you don't you don't you don't break another's heart by lashing them with the law you don't do it. You don't do it. I saw a good illustration of this yesterday. A man was doing a demonstration in some sort of business meeting, and he had a guy, and he said, stand here by me, and he said, now walk with me. And the guy started walking with him, and they walked across the room. And then they said, now stand here and face me, and the guy stood there and faced him. And he bent over, and he started pushing on the guy's hands, and the guy started pushing back on his hands. And the point was, when he just said, come walk along with me. The guy just freely walked along with him and had no problem walking with him. When he started pushing against him, the guy pushed back. We need this gospel. Say, come along. Walk beside me. Not, not pushing. Not pushing. Bulls and goats push. God gives his people grace to lead his dear children along like he does. And he does this for us every day. Every day he's giving you grace. Every day he's giving you mercy. Every day he's forgiving you. Every day he's showing you he is your righteousness and your all by your constant, continual slips of the tongue and things you think and things you say and things you do, and yet he keeps on ministering in your heart. He's making you personally know that. Why? So you can minister to one another. He's working everything, and nothing's happening by accident. It's all on purpose to show us he really is everything and all. And it's to give us the grace in our hearts to remind each other this is so. So here's the point. Christ our head is the power who gets the glory for filling all in all his members. This is why God the Father has put all things under his feet and gave him to the be, be the head over all things to the church that Christ might get the glory for filling all in all. If you do anything honoring to him, he's getting the glory. If he did it, you're going to give him the glory. Gladly, willingly, want him to have it because he did it. So let me repeat the good news one more time. Christ our head, this is the good news. It means headship. It means what he did, we did. We're righteous by him. Christ being our head is good news because he's our life. He's the life in his body, the life of each member in particular, and he'll see to it we have this life. It's good news because Christ our head is Lord, ruling all, filling all, in all, in each member of his body. Now, how long will he do this? A few years back, somebody started, some man started preaching, saying the 
church age is over. The Lord's not sending his preachers anymore. He's, just stay home. Listen to me. That's what he was telling everybody. Stay home, listen to me. How long is he going to keep doing this? Turn over to Ephesians 4.13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Remember, his body is the fullness of him. That the good news of that is, brethren, if one member of his body, one elect redeemed child is left out, his body won't be complete. You think that's going to happen? No. No. He shall not fail. And because he shall not fail, we shall not fail. He shall continue to work this work till he's called every one of his members of his body to the unity of the faith and grown us up into him and so that his body is full and complete. And in that day, he's going to present us to the Father, holy, without spot, without blemish, perfect, all created by his righteousness alone. Now, this power, brethren, you remember when our Lord came to his disciples, this power of his to work all this, this was the thing that he spoke of to give them the confidence to go forth and preach the gospel. He said in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. <laughs> That's our confidence. He shall not fail. Till he has set judgment in the earth, therefore we shall not fail. He shall fail all in all. Christ is our head, brethren. Let's bow to him and worship him. Father, we thank you that you've made Christ our head. We're thankful that he is all these things unto us. What good news we have. Lord, help us, give us that power and that grace and the gifts of your grace to minister to one another, to be useful in your church, to preach your word to one another and to this world. What a privilege. You don't need us. You don't have to have us. And yet you've given us this privilege not only of saving us by your grace, but using us to preach your word, to help your brethren and one another. Lord, thank you for this privilege. Keep us and use us for this purpose. And give Christ, your son, all the glory. We want him to have it. And Lord, help us to glorify him in everything we do. We're thankful you made Christ our head. It's in him we pray. Amen.